this afternoon, I, I, we're starting a new series, um, When You Pray series, and we're going to be talking over the next few weeks about prayer. In this house and in our lives, we believe that prayer is like the firebox in a train. If you know what I'm talking about, it's, it's that part of the train where they, they, they take the, the engineers would take the coal and throw it into the fire that will create the steam, create the heat that will propel and, and move the train along. In other places, they would call it the boiler room. And, and we firmly believe that prayer is that for not just the church, but for us as our indivi- in our individual lives, that it is impossible. Um, I've, I remember a saying that, that uh, was said um, some time ago that um, you, to, to, I want to say this right, maybe I should just reserve that for when I remember everything, but you cannot, you know, to, for a Christian to be in prayer is as natural for a, a human being to breathe. And essentially what they are saying is that in as much as we need air to function, to live, to go about our days, a a believer, a child of God, a Christian needs prayer just as much. And so we're going to be talking about prayer in um, in the next few weeks. And my goal, especially today, is not so that you would attend prayer meeting and if I, if by all means, I believe that prayer meetings should be, if we understand prayer correctly, that prayer meetings should be the most well-attended gatherings in any church. Thank you, Pastor Happy. <laughs> that goes to tell me that we need to teach this, uh, that reaction. But this, this is the most important thing. Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of activities. My house shall be called a house of programs. My house shall be called a house of fun and games. He doesn't say that. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so this this is the the part of, of our church life that I would love to, by the grace of God, strengthen in each one of our lives. And so the goal of this series is not so that you would attend a prayer meeting when it comes to your city, or even yet, uh, even better, that you would host a prayer meeting in your house or in your apartment. My goal is that you would not not just attend a prayer meeting, but that you would become a house of prayer. And when I say house of prayer, I don't mean the church house of prayer. I mean you as an individual, your house, your, you, you, you know, Peter says, puts it this way. You also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You're, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so my goal is, is way beyond your attendance at a prayer meeting. My goal and my heart's desire today by the grace of God is that you become a, a house of prayer. That everywhere you go, June, is, is that June? Oh, Brampton is here. <laughs> hey, you call, anybody else from out of town? You kind of caught me by surprise there, June. Welcome, brother. Um, where was I? that you become a house of prayer. You see, when you understand prayer and when you become fervent in prayer, nobody has to drag you to a prayer meeting. You become a walking, living, breathing prayer meeting everywhere you go. You're praying for people that you meet across the street. You're, may, you're praying for your, your neighbors. You're praying for, for people that, 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 that the Lord puts a burden on you. And so my goal and my heart is that we don't just come to a prayer meeting, that we become a house of prayer individually so that when we come together corporately, the fire of God comes down and things begins to shift in the atmosphere because there's a power and an agreement in our faith because we're walking in a lifestyle of prayer like what? we're called to be yet this is uh, this is part of what i what i've been sensing over the past few months and and i'm not sure if you saw the theme over the past few months i believe it started um just before father's day that i really began to have a a sense in my heart of what the lord is saying to perhaps the church in general but but even more so for us 
that there is a there is a drawing of God to his church he's drawing you and I back to a place of first love he's drawing you and I back outside of the programs outside of the activities outside of the fun and the games and all of those things I'm not against that but I, I sensed in my heart for months now that the Lord is calling the church back to her first love to the place of intimacy and and you and, and I don't know if you caught it but the past few messages that have come from this pulpit there is this thread that has gone through those messages and, the, and that thread is the is a call for intimacy back with the father whether that was Michelle coming here and preaching about abiding in the vine and, and Christine preaching about to to to, to love and to know and, and, and even Dr. Roy's message last week about the, the dangers of, of sin, and, and th even that message was, in a way, God's invitation for us to turn away from our pet sins and our secret sins to a place of intimacy and being right with Him. The thread through all of these weeks that we have been talking is that God is calling you and calling me back to a place of first love. That we don't just go through the motions of Christianity and, 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 and churchianity, but that we would really have a fervent fire in our hearts for God and God alone. So he's calling us way beyond just attending a prayer meeting. If you remember, there was a parable in Matthew 24, 25, and even some of 26, when Jesus is talking about and teaching the disciples about, about the, the last days, he gave a parable of the ten virgins, the five of them being wise and the other five being unwise, that they all came and they were excited to meet the bridegroom. But because the bridegroom was delayed in his coming, they all fell asleep. And then when the time came for the bridegroom to show up in the middle of the night when they did not expect, the, the, the wise virgins had fire in their lamps while the unwise was running out of oil and they missed out on the visitation of the bridegroom. You see, we can be Christians for so long and be fervent in the early days, but the question is not how you start, it's how you finish. It's not about how you begin, it's can you last the journey through all the betrayals, through all the, 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 the pain and the hurt and the offenses and the, and the delayed um, answers to prayers where hope deferred makes the heart sick. Can you continue walking and still be fervent in your love? Can you, can you go through the, the years of, of, of living through this life and what this life has to has to throw at us and still have a fire burning inside of our hearts for the bridegroom whose name is Jesus. You see, that's what we're called to do and that's what my fear is, is that, that the, with all of these things that is happening around the globe and around the world, there are, these are the things that you're seeing, the wars and the rumors of wars, these are reflection of what is happening in the spirit realm. That there is a war that is happening in the spirit that is being manifested today in the Middle East and in Europe and, and wherever else that we're seeing this, this, this turbulence. There is a war that is happening in the spirit, but I also believe simultaneously that there, is a, that, that there is a war that the Lord is fighting, and that is the war for the hearts of His people. Is that we don't get distracted by all of the things and, and fall into fear and anxiety and, and anxiousness and, and our hearts for Him will begin to grow cold in the last days. And so friends, this, this thought, this, this, this urging in my heart that I cannot get away from, for how long are we going to talk about this and go at it from different angles? I really don't know. But I know that it is, it is, it is the Lord calling His church back to, his, to their place, to her place of first love. I don't know where you are at. I just know where I am at. And I know where the Lord wants us to be in our hearts. You see, it's not just about the activities that we do because we can be here and we can attend all sorts of activities. The question is, where is your heart? You can go through the motions and do everything the same, just like the, the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, where they were, they were calling out the false apostles. They were doing great work. They were, they were advancing still. They were doing the good work still. But Jesus says, I have this complaint against you. You have forsaken 
your first love. Oh, that you would go back to what you did at first, he says. Because it's not so much about what we can do for the kingdom. It is our heart still burning with him. Is our hearts still burning with him? Is our hearts still burning for him? Will we still worship when the, when the worship team is out of tune? Will we still give our all when, 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 the, when, the, when it's too cold in the room and the seats are not as comfortable and there's no snacks prepared beforehand when you, as you walk into the community room? Or does it, any of that even matter? I want to get to the place where none of that matters. When we come before the Lord and we begin to worship that our hearts are focused, laser focused in on Him, that it doesn't matter what is going on in the room, my heart is anchored on Him and I'm having this encounter with Jesus and expressing and, and receiving the love of God for me. That's when you know that you are in that place and your heart is burning when nothing else is distracting you from it. You remember when you first fell in love with your spouse, that it didn't matter how many hours you had to work over time, you could stand on that machine for 12 hours straight. And you just, I'm trying to be serious. It's true. You remember that? You're standing in that machine, you got a smile on your face. Stop. You, you, you stand there and nothing is bothering you. you. You're an annoying co-worker. Now you don't even pay attention to them. The boss that's always riding you, doesn't, every time they talk to you or they, they complain and, and they, run, you know, they run you down, nothing ever bothers you. Why? Because there's a focus. There's something that is greater that is taking up your attention and your affection. In this, in this <laughs> you're not helping right now. Like <laughs> trying to stay focused with my message. But there is, that's what I'm talking, this, when all of these things are happening, is our heart still anchored on Him that it doesn't matter what is happening here because this is so connected that I am enamored with the face of Jesus, my Lord. So I want to talk to us today about prayer. Our text today is in Luke 11, verse 1. One verse. I don't have so much of a teaching today as I have a message. And I pray that you would receive it, you would catch it, and you would run with it, that you would begin to live it. You know, this Jesus that we talk about, we preach about, that we sing about here in church, I've said it before a few weeks ago, but sometimes we can, we can go through the motions and, and, and really not have the reality of Jesus present in our hearts and in our minds. It's like seeing karaoke to this unknown God. But this one that we sing to, this one that we talk about, this one that we preach about, this, this one that, that, that we, 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 we plan our lives around, this, this one whose name is Jesus is real. And the reality of Jesus must, uh, must, must apprehend our hearts. That is the hope of everything we do is that all of these things is towards and about a Jesus who is alive and who is real. In Luke 11 verse 1, it says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Initial reading of that, we can read through that verse and read on. But within that verse is this great mystery. Within that verse is this, this that needs to be unpacked because it is profound. And it impacts the way that we begin and we should see what prayer is. 
Teach us to pray. Jesus was praying. And when he was done praying, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. I want us to understand something. That the disciples of old were not people who were Gentiles. They were not people who did not know how to pray. The first disciples of Christ, the 12 disciples, were all Jewish. They were all Hebrews. They knew prayer. They prayed three times a day. They have prayer books. Prayer is part of their culture. Prayer is a habit that has been ingrained in them from from early stages of when they can begin to talk and they can begin to crawl and walk. Prayer is part. Part of their lifestyle, part of their culture. They didn't need to be taught. They knew that in certain times of the day, they are to go to the temple and they are to pray. Prayer books were handed down. There were a people that prayed three times a day. David says in Psalms 55, Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. In other words, he was praying to God. Some of us would say, yeah, I pray three times a day, maybe six times over every meal that I eat. But the Jews knew prayer. Daniel says in, verse, in chapter 6, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to to his God, just as he had done before. You remember that in the case of Daniel, that was the way that they were able, able to entrap him. Was that because they knew that he was going to be praying to Yahweh, they knew that he was going to be praying to God, they used that against him. Prayer was part of their lifestyle. They were a people of whom prayer was part of their culture, a habit ingrained as much as eating kosher meals was, celebrating the different feasts, or coming to worship at the temple or hear teachings at the synagogue. It was part of what they did. It was ingrained in them which makes the requests all the more intriguing. You understand that when the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray, it's like asking, it's like like a Filipino going to somebody else and say, can you teach us how to cook rice? (laughs) Or or a Portuguese going to somebody else saying, can you teach us how how to cook sardines? It's so part of us that we don't need to be taught because we walk in it, we do it. But yet, here are the disciples now seeing Jesus praying. And as soon as he was done, they go to him, Lord, can you teach us how to pray? In other words, there was something that they were doing habitually that they were missing internally. They were doing something day after day, month after day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, but yet they were missing on something that, that, was, that was so present in Jesus because you could do things out of habit and still miss out on your, your, your encounter with God through that. Lord, teach us to pray. The disciples had been watching Jesus. How he prayed, what he prayed, but more importantly, I believe that they began to notice what would happen to him when he prayed. They knew that Jesus was going to pray. They knew that because they grew up in that. They knew perhaps what he would pray about. But what they began to notice, I believe, is what would happen to him when he prayed. I believe that it wasn't the act of prayer that they noticed, but rather the effect of prayer on Jesus that drove them to ask him to teach them how to pray. You see, when Jesus prayed... The father heard him, but something also happened to him. 
In Luke chapter 9, verse 29, it says, as, as he, Jesus, was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. We know this context was in the Mount of Transfiguration, that Jesus went and prayed, and his face began to shine as he was communing with the Father. His countenance changed. His being changed. Through what? Through prayer. Why? Because he's communing with the Heavenly Father, face to face with his Father. Do our countenance change? Perhaps you and I are like the disciples. We go to prayer meetings like they did three times a day. But the only thing that changed is the time of day and our countenance remained the same. You see, is it the question I have for us today is, could it be that we're missing something? Could it be that we're missing something about prayer? So they saw Jesus when he prayed. It wasn't a drag to him. It wasn't a chore to him. He willingly, in, in other parts of Scripture, it tells us that Jesus arose early in the morning and went out to pray. Even when it was not yet the time of prayer, he went out to commune with the Father. And they saw this, and they saw the transfiguration. They saw how his face changed and, and his countenance changed. You see, the pursuit of prayer, my friends, the pursuit of prayer is not the discipline of prayer. It's not just the dis a discipline of prayer is good. We, we, some of us need more of that. But that is not the pursuit of prayer. We don't pray just so we can check off the box that we have prayed. We don't go to prayer meetings so that, hey, life group leader, check it out. My attendance was there. I was there. We don't pray just so we can go through the act and the discipline of prayer. Because that can lead to religiosity. We don't pray because we are in pursuit of answered prayer. I'm all for answered prayer. That's one of the reasons why we have prayer meetings. We believe in answered prayers. But that is not the pursuit of prayer. You see, the pursuit of answered prayer can lead to idolatry. Where you idolize the answered prayer rather than the one that you are communing with. The, the idolizing of answered prayer that when prayers are not answered, you throw a tantrum like a teenage kid and, and leave God because your prayers were not answered. Hope deferred makes the heart sick and therefore you turn. Why? Because we're after the, the, the answer to prayer rather than pursuing Jesus. The pursuit of prayer is not spiritual discipline of praying, though that is good. It is not the pursuit of having ans prayers answered, though in that we find joy. It is not to convince God to agree with you. It is not to twist and manipulate God to do your will. It is not to get anointed lineup for worship or to have something to share in your life group. My friends, my brothers and sisters, the pursuit of prayer is the presence of God and the person of Jesus Christ. That is why we pray. We pray to be with Him. We pray to be in the presence of God. Yes, we have prayer concerns. Yes, we have prayer requests. Yes, Jesus prayed for himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yes, to all of those things. But Jesus went into prayer every single day. Why? So that he could be one with the Father. The pursuit of prayer, the ultimate pursuit of prayer is the presence of God. Luke 9, 29, again, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. As he was spending time 
in prayer. You notice that in that Mount of Transfiguration account, it does, the Bible doesn't tell us what prayer request Jesus the Son brought to God the Father. It just said that he was in the presence of God. And as he was praying, his countenance changed. I believe that Luke 3, verse 21 and 22 is a visual illustration of what happens in prayer. Luke 3 says this, When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. I believe that prayer, that's, that, that, that text is a visual illustration of what happens when we pray or what's, what should be happening, what we desire to be happening when we pray. That when we go to our secret place, the heavens will open up and the Spirit of God descending and fellowshipping with us and we are now in the presence of our Heavenly Father and in that place we begin to hear the voice of God. You are my son. You are my daughter. You don't need to fear a, a, a financial crisis. You don't need to fear this. It's in that place of intimacy that we hear the voice of God speaking to us the word that our hearts need to be at peace with Him. I believe that that's what happens when, when we go to our secret place not seeking for answers. Not seeking for, not because we have, we, some, some of us, we only go to our prayer closets when we have a need. And therefore our intimacy with God is based on a need. Based on a problem. We only go when we have problems. We only go when, when our girlfriend breaks up with us. We only go when, when, when there's financial crisis. That means that our intimacy with God is based on is problem based. So we only go when we have issues. And when there are, issue, when there are no issues, that means we have no intimacy with God. You see, the pursuit of prayer is intimacy being one with the Father. And I just so happen to have these things I'll talk about later on, Father. But right now, it's about me and you. It's about me and you, my Father in heaven. And as I'm communing with him, as I'm being one with him, it's like, oh, by the way, Dad, I wanted to talk to you about this thing. You see, for us parents, we, want, we desire for our children to come to us not only when they have need, we don't mind that they have needs. But imagine your children only coming to you when they have a need. It's not that we don't want to provide for it. It's that the relationship is not need-based. But the Father is looking for our hearts to be turned back to Him, that we desire Him more than any answer prayer. Father, whether, you, whether I get the answers I want to this issue or not, I'm going to love you anyways. I, I, I'm going to honor you anyways. I'm gonna, I, I, I prioritize you anyways. I trust you for the answer, whether yes, no, maybe, later, whatever it may be. You are my priority. My heart's cry is to be with you. It's not answers to this. It's not getting this from you. It's not getting that from you. It's I just want to be with you. There is a sweet fellowship that takes place which then fuels our prayer life. There's a sweet fellowship. The heavens open. The Holy Spirit descends upon him and now he hears the voice of the Father giving him affirmation. There's this sweet fellowship that takes place which then fuels our prayer life. When the pursuit of prayer is not the answers to request but His presence, we will never run from prayer meetings but to prayer meetings. When the pursuit of prayer is not the answers to prayer but His presence, every time we're there, we, in, we are in His presence. 
His presence is released over us. Our hearts become one with His, and we hear His voice, which fuels a longing for more of Him in our hearts. And we will therefore stop running from prayer meetings, but rather to prayer meetings. Friends, I believe that answered prayer, breakthrough, deliverance, healing, all that is a result of prayer. I believe in the power of prayer. And, we're, and Pastor Abby is going to talk about that next week. I believe in the power of prayer. Don't get me wrong. We have seen many prayers answered, and we have seen some prayers not answered. But whether we get answers to prayer or we don't get answers to prayer, blessed be the name of our God. Amen. Answered prayer, breakthrough, deliverance, healing, financial miracles, all that is a result of prayer is intended to serve as an invitation to better know this God who answers prayer and an open call for you and I to spend more time in pursuit of Him. When the Father answers prayer, that is not your cue to excuse yourself from being with Him. I personally believe that each time that the Father in His goodness, in His faithfulness, in His omniscience answers prayer, whether that be yes or no, the answered prayer is His invitation to draw us closer to Him. He's always drawing us closer, ever closer to Him. That when we have our prayers answered, that we fall on our knees and say, who is this God? Who, who, who am I that I am able to have this honor to speak with Him? And He listened. I need to know more of who He is. Not for more of what he, I can get from Him, but I want to know more of His, who, who is this good God? Who is this faithful God? Who is this merciful God? Who is this gracious God? It draws me closer to Him. It is His presence that sustains us in times of prayer. Luke 6 says this, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Friends, are we missing something about prayer? Is there something about prayer that we're not yet quite getting? Because Jesus spent all night communing with the Father. He spent all night praying. How many of you, uh, don't raise your hand, have been in prayer meetings and you prayed for two minutes and you're done? How many of you fear going to prayer meetings because you're afraid that you will be tasked or you'll be assigned to pray for a prayer item and you know you only got about 30 seconds in the tank? I'm, come on, let's get real now. How is so-and-so able to pray for like five minutes and I got like 10 seconds and I'm done? Even my prayer, Lord, thank you for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. And that's like your, that's your prayer life. That's your whole prayer life. That's the whole intercessor, intercessory prayer that you know of. Thank you for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. Is it because there's something about the nature of prayer that we're missing out on? I believe that when it, the pursuit of prayer is to be with God, to be in the presence of God that we would be able to spend time communing with God and it will not be a drag. You remember how Moses 
spent 40 days and 40 nights in a mountain, came down, got upset, broke the tablets, and God had to bring him back up to the mountain for another 40 days and 40 nights. He was there 40 to 80 days and 80 nights. And the Bible tells us that he, he, he the Bible doesn't tell us that he, was, he brought camping food with him. Some people would say that's impossible. He was up there for 80 days and 80 nights without eating and drinking. It may be in human flesh. But in the presence of God, you see, time flies. That's why in heaven there is no time. Because when you are caught up in the presence of God, there is no time. Jesus spent all night praying to God because he wasn't in it to get his prayer requests answered. He wasn't in it to try to convince God that his plan is better than God's. He wasn't in it to try to manipulate God to answering his prayer requests. He simply was there to be with God. What if that is a pursuit of our prayer life not necessarily to get it I'm not, I'm not saying you can't pray for needs obviously he's our father he he knows our needs before we even say it but having known that what happens then is okay since he knows that then i can just come and just be with him And I'm not saying that prayer has to be like the way Pastor Happy does it or I do it or anybody else in this room does it. It's, prayer is communion. It's talking with God. It's having a, 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 a communication with God, however way that looks. It is the presence of God in prayer that sustains us. In Luke 5, it says, Yet news about him, talking about Jesus, Yet news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. For some, for some of us, we probably would have stayed with the people and gotten our fix of affirmation gotten our fix of boosting our self-confidence, hearing the accolades, look how great you are, look what you did, and blind man seeing, dead man walking, all of these things. But see, success, success did not satisfy mm. Jesus. Yeah. Ministry success did not sustain him. There's something that is so much sweeter than the accolades of man. There is something so much sweeter than the applause of man. There is something that is greater, that is, it is in the place of prayer that you're hearing the voice of the Father and the presence of God. And Jesus says, I don't care about the accolades, the applauses, the recognition, all those things. They don't satisfy me. The place of prayer and intimacy with the Father is what sustains me it feeds me it nourishes me it strengthens me i am one with the father and that is the greatest blessing of all is the presence of god in your life that's what we could people give you great job great preaching whatever okay what it's in this presence it's hearing Okay, we've heard the multitudes and what they all got to say. But Father, I want to hear what you have to say. I know that the multitudes will cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord. One day and a few days later, they'll cry out, crucify him. And so Lord, I don't get my sustenance and I don't get my, my strength and my source from them. Father, I'm here to be with you. I, I love you. I I receive your love for me. I'm here for you in this place called prayer. I want to close with this. Luke 11, 1, again, he says, Lord, teach us to pray. 
just as John taught his disciples. <laughs> Man, they're fighting over prayer. Teach us, Lord, they're learning how to pray. I want to pray. Do you, do you, do you hear? Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. There's an eagerness to pray. There's an eagerness to come before the Lord. There's an eagerness to w learn the secret place called prayer. There's an eagerness in the, in the disciples just as, I, I don't want to be left out in this. I don't want to be missing out on what John's disciples are, 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 are experiencing right now. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us the secret place. There's an eagerness in them. To, to learn to press in, to, to learn to be in the presence of God in a place called prayer. Friends, there's something I'm not asking anymore. I'm telling you right now that there's something that we don't understand about prayer. We're missing out on something. If they are fighting over learning how to pray so that they can pray, if not just effectively in power, but to be in the presence of God, I'm telling you there's something about prayer that you and I are missing. And I believe that, the, that what we're missing is the, is, is the principle that prayer is not necessarily about getting prayers answered. It's not necessarily about going through the disciplines of prayer. Those are all good and we need them. But when we come to a place of prayer, it is the pursuit of the presence of God. Because when you pursue the presence of God, you will never miss out on it. He always comes. He says, draw unto me and I will draw unto you. Seek me with all of your heart and you will find me. So when we come to a place of prayer, even starting tonight, before we lay in bed, we, we just take time to be with him. Lord, thank you for the day that has been. Thank you for your grace that has been sufficient. Thank you that, Lord, the connection between my heart and yours and your heart to mine was unbroken throughout this day. Thank you that everywhere I went today, I, I could feel your abiding presence in my life. I could feel and I could, I could, I could, I can experience your affirmation. I, I feel your, your acceptance of me. You're looking down from heaven at me because of the cross. I'm accepted in the beloved. Lord, thank you that you have been with me throughout this day. And even now, Father, just to be with you, to hear your voice. Speak to me, Father. Speak to me, Holy Spirit. And allow him to speak to you. The pursuit of prayer is the presence of God. It's the presence of the Father. Teach us to pray, Lord. Just as John taught his disciples to pray, and Jesus said, let me tell you the first thing about prayer. And this is what it's about. Our Father coming back to a place of relationship. Yes, there's supplication. Yes, there's petition. Yes, there's prayer requests. But it's putting Him first. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then, we pray about our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Church family, I, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Father is calling us back to a place of first love. And that even in our time of prayer, it is still about being with our first love. It's still about being with Abba Father.